All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Gabe Hakim from Promise Venture Studio, and I'm joined by my colleagues, Awara Adeagbo and Michael Doherty. Uh, and I'm looking forward to being your host for the next 59, 59 minutes. We have a real treat for you here today. Um, and to get us started, I'll just give a quick run through of the agenda and some ground rules. Uh, I'm excited to shortly hand over our, to our wonderful partners from Sesame Workshop, and we'll hear from Jeff and Rosemary uh, for about a half hour, 35 minutes, and then um, hopefully have some time for Q&A at the end too. But as we go through this session, I do want to encourage you to feel free to drop your questions into the chat box, and we'll do our best to address as many of them as possible, uh, either along the way or in the Q&A session at the end. Um, and we're also planning to conclude this session today uh, by sharing a bit of information about our upcoming Promising Ventures Fellowship Program. So stay tuned for that. For those of you who are new to Promise, we are a nonprofit organization that attracts, supports, and connects social entrepreneurs, funders, and other leaders in the early childhood development field. And we do this to help drive greater impact, especially for children and families facing the greatest adversity. Our vision is a world where all children, no matter their background, can fulfill their innate promise. We believe that talent is everywhere, but opportunity is not. And we know every one of you on this call today has committed your life energy to changing this. So thank you for what you do and how much you put into it. Again, for those who are new to Promise, uh, we have a Promise Venture Network, which is a community of social entrepreneurs representing over 200 ventures and organizations around the country. And a big part of our organization's work is supporting these ventures. Um, and our upcoming fellowship program is one piece of that. We'll talk about the fellowship more at the end of our call, but to give you a quick sneak peek, the fellowship is a 12 week, no cost virtual accelerator for early childhood entrepreneurs pursuing social impact and growth goals. Promise runs this program in partnership with our partners at the Harvard Center on the Developing Child and Sesame Workshop. And the application for the fellowship opens on May, or sorry, Monday, June 29th. That's this coming Monday, and the program begins on September 3rd. Today's session is meant to give you a flavor of the type of expertise and support you'll have access to as a Promising Ventures Fellow. Beyond help pursuing your own social impact and growth goals, you'll get the opportunity to learn from experts in the field, such as the one we, ones we have on today's call. And on that note, I'm thrilled to introduce you to today's experts from Sesame Workshop. I can speak uh, on have behalf of myself that um, I know many of us hold Sesame Workshop and Sesame Street up as a model of scaled impact in the early childhood field. And even at 50 years young, I know that they continue to innovate every day and are model social entrepreneurs for all of us. So, as I said in the beginning, I think it's a real treat to have Jeff Dunn and Rosemary Trulio from Sesame Workshop here today. They will lead us in a session uh, titled Caring for Each Other with Comfort via Creative Play. And they'll be sharing thoughts about the impact of the pandemic on learning, the organizational challenges of the current situation, and how Sesame Workshop has uh, plans and continues to execute on helping children to grow smarter, stronger, and kinder as we emerge in emerge into this changing world. We hope that the stories and lessons that they share will help social entrepreneurs such as yourself maximize your impact for children, families, and the caregivers that you serve. So I will turn it over to them now uh, to share their presentations and we'll start with you, Rosemary. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Gabe. Sesame Street, as you all probably know, began with a research question. Can you use television to teach preschoolers uh, to be ready for school and to um, be prepared for life, basically. And the answer was yes. And Sesame Workshop's mission to help kids grow smarter, stronger, and kinder continues 50 plus years later. Next slide. So Sesame Street is driven by what we call a comprehensive school readiness curriculum. And we define smarter as those very important academic skills, those content skills, but we also acknowledge the critical executive function skills. These are those cognitive processing skills that help children learn content skills, as well as social emotional skills and uh, 
um, resiliency skills, as you'll, you'll hear later on. So stronger is, um, includes um, keeping your body healthy and strong, uh, but also includes those resiliency skills. Um, and then kinder is Sesame Street has always been a kind street uh, and a diverse and inclusive street, but really focusing on the perspective taking and empathy and compassion and very important mindfulness skills. Because if you are not self-regulated, it's really hard for you to look at someone else in an empathetic way and go that extra step and be compassionate. Next slide, please. So the Sesame Workshop, the Sesame Street curriculum is a dynamic curriculum. It's always evolving based on research and best practices from the fields of education and developmental psychology. So we're always evolving. And a most recent change is to put those executive function, self-regulation, cognitive processing skills, those thinking skills at the core of everything that we do. Because without them, you can't learn those content skills, those academic skills. You can't have the social emotional uh, regulation that you need. And as we all know, anyone who's trying to stay healthy these days, you need to have those self-regulation skills uh, in order to make healthy choices. Next slide, please. So I just want to give you a glimpse into um, our world of content development. And I want to focus on the middle part of um, this slide, which is what we call the Sesame Workshop model. And this is a model that Joan Gans Cooney and Lloyd Morissette, our co-founders, put together and is really at the cornerstone of everything that we do. And I think it's like the, our secret sauce of success and why we're still around 50 plus years later. They felt that for us to be mission driven, and to be unique, three disciplines have to work collaboratively together. They refer to it as a marriage where there are compromises that are being done all, all the time. So we need to have the educators help us in terms of coming up with what are those core essential school readiness curriculum goals, but we also have to partner very closely with the developmental psychologist those who actually know how to study how children learn. Now, anybody in the field of education knows that developmental psychologists don't often spend a lot of time with educators. So that connection, that relationship was a novel one. Now we're gonna add in the third discipline, which is production. These are the writers, the producers, the animators, the songwriters, and they don't come from an education background or a developmental psychology background. They're coming from a comedy background, storytelling background. So we all have to work together in service of the needs of children. And that's why Joan said, while we're all experts and we're doing our best to put that best, our best foot forward in, in script development, you don't really know if it's working or not working until you go to the real experts, the children themselves, which is why formative research is such a critical component of, of everything that we do. So we start with the assessment of the need. So yes, Sesame Street is based on a whole child curriculum, but we wanna make sure that we're creating content to meet the current needs of today's children. So what are those needs? We do our background research, we identify a need, then we have a curriculum seminar where we're bringing in those experts to help us hone our goals and messages. We revise the curriculum, we work with the writers, we begin to develop the scripts, we engage in formative research, and then it's ready for distribution. And the ultimate test to see if we've actually addressed these critical needs is to do a summative evaluation. Next slide. And our content is across all platforms. So we are sure that we are reaching kids where they are. Next slide. And it's not enough for us to create child-directed content. We also need to bring in the adults in children's lives. Now Sesame, as you know, 
uh, always prided itself on being this uh, dual audience. And the reason for that is that we know that when you create educational content that the adult can share with the child, that experience is going to um, enhance the educational benefits of the educational content. In this case, we want to reach the family members, yes, through television, if they want to join in. And, and we're seeing that quite a bit now with COVID-19, um, uh, where they're co-engaging more with, with uh, screens as a family. Um, but to like live shows, for instance, and themed entertainment, where you have a captive family audience. And through the work of our social impact, um, so Sesame Street and communities working directly with schools um, in terms of uh, providing supplemental curriculum and then community at, at large. Next slide, please. So now I want to focus specifically on how we created content to address this immediate crisis that we're all uh, facing. So both domestically and internationally. So we took a global approach. And so that's why you see this animated look of our characters because animation travels uh, best. So you'll see Elmo and uh, Grover engaged in washing their hands. And Chunky is the, um, the girl up in the uh, top corner. Uh, she is our uh, female uh, character um, in our uh, co in India co-production. And in the lower corner uh, is Raya, who was created for our uh, WASH program, which is water and sanitation and hygiene. And in that particular case, she's using what we call a tippy tap to wash her hands because there's no access to running water. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, everything starts with an educational framework. So what are the needs that we need to address? What is happening and how best can we help children and, and families during this pandemic? So we did break it down into these two broad categories. And one is about the prevention. So we're staying healthy. Um, and I'm using the word healthy. A lot of people say stay safe. Well, for a young child, that has a different meaning. So we're very careful about the language that we use for really young children. So how to stay healthy and if someone is ill, how to cope with an illness. And in the other category, the other broad category is the emotional support because as we all know, these are very stressful times and has had a tremendous impact on, on families. And how do we help families um, so the adults to take care of themselves so that they can be there to take care of their children and then to take their care of their children in terms of building resiliency skills. Next slide, please. So this is an example of some of our health content. So you can see in the corner here, um, um, there's a lot of um, visuals and um, these messages about wearing the ma a mask, so the do's and, and, and the don'ts, and getting this critical information out. Um, there's a story um, in the, uh, the lower corner um, where the dad gets sick and he's quarantined in his bedroom. And how does the family cope with that? How do they take care of dad? How do they protect um, themselves um, from, from not getting, getting sick? Um, some great information about six feet apart, what does that look like? What does that mean? Um, and you know, how to eat well, how to get sleep. So the importance of routines, um, which I know that families were having a, a difficult time with. How do you keep the routine so that um, things are moving um, more slow, uh, more, more smoothly? Next slide, please. So what um, the emotional support, um, I talked about routines. Parents were really struggling with this new normal. Everyone is home, parents are working, kids are now attending virtual school. Uh, parents feel torn, like how does my three-year-old participate in a Zoom class while I'm trying to work? Um, children want to say, well, where happened, why I can't see my friends? So how do I connect them socially with, with, with friends? Um, and also dealing with, you know, some families, unfortunately, had to 
deal with loss. And so uh, we, we, we have some uh, materials coming out with um, how Elmo is dealing with the loss of a neighbor uh, who's passed away. So we're dealing with the, the more immediate needs, these social emotional needs, building these resiliency skills, helping children understand that they can't always get what they need. How do you, how do you support them and understand that um, you could have these big feelings and these big emotions and to help parents understand that it's important to validate these feelings, but more importantly, how to help them cope with these feelings. Because what we're, what we're learning is that parents, because they are so stressed themselves, they're trying to just make that feeling go away. You know, you're going to be okay. Uh, everything's going to be fine. Or comfort them in a way that they're not able to fully understand what this feeling is, why they're having it, but more importantly, giving them the opportunity to cope with that feeling and then to transition on to, to something else. In terms of these long-term consequences, uh, consequences. Jeanette and her team, they're working on other content that will be dealing with these systemic disparities, xenophobia, and, and vulnerable groups. So keep watch on our website. It's sesamestreetincommunities.org for these wonderful resources. Next slide, please. So as you can see, these are all the resources. So there are videos, there's, um, there are printables, there are uh, apps. There's this great family play app. Once again, parents are looking for lots of activities. What can I do? And that's a great app that says, okay, um, I'm home. I'm in the living room. I have two kids. What kinds of activities do you have for me? And uh, it, it, it does um, a rotation of, of, of a range of activities. And these wonderful videos. Next slide, please. The other thing that we did very quickly um, in response is that we knew that we needed to organize content for families. They needed help and they've come to us Sesame Workshop because we have a long history in providing resources during stressful and tough times uh, and dealt with a lot of traumatic issues in the lives of, of children and families over the years. And so we put this website together. Um, um, and as you can see in that first bucket, it's called caring for yourself and your family. That bucket has a lot of resources for parents to help them through in terms of understanding how you need to take care of yourself. Um, you need to have those quiet time moments and, and, and uh, have a calming down time because Sort of like when you're on a plane, they'll say, if the oxygen mask drops, put the mask on yourself first and then your child. Because if you are not able, if you don't, if you're not properly oxygenated, you won't be able to take care of your, your, your child. And guiding them on how to create routines. And what do you do? How do you spend the whole day in quarantine day after day, weeks after weeks, and months after months as we're all experiencing. So the next bucket is play, watch, and learn. And what we are emphasizing there are these playful learning moments. How do you set up play for your child? And, or better yet, how can you co-engage in a playful moment that is really driving a lesson because we know that children learn best through play and you can teach a whole child school readiness uh, curriculum through play and so there um, there there were weekly activities um, that uh, would just go step by step for parents about how they they can co-engage in these um, learning moments and some of them are not added moments like you you have to make breakfast, lunch, and dinner. How do you co-engage your child? Because preparing a meal involves literacy and involves science and involves math. The other is watch and learn. It goes back to those golden days where you would sit on the couch and, and um, cuddle with your child and, and uh, watch Sesame Street or other uh, children's programs. And in this particular case, we were featuring Esme and Roy, which is a new show that we created, which is all about mindfulness and learning through play. And so watch together, but then provide examples of what you could do to extend the learning of, uh, with a, um, a hands-on activity. 
Next slide, please. And I love these moments. There are these videos that we would start at the top of the uh, web page. And um, we're so fortunate to have Elmo's um, father talk about how hard it's been. And so this is an example of using a Muppet parent to connect with our parents and say, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. Um, I'm, I'm stressed and this is what I do. And we also featured uh, Alan uh, talking about flexibility, how it's important to be, to be flexible. So next slide, please. The other thing that we did, which um, was truly remarkable, um, we had an opportunity to do a primetime special for families. So that, this is an example of bringing the families together to, to watch a Sesame Street um, special featuring a range of celebrities. Um, talking about what we're all going through and that we're all in this together. So it starts out as a Zoom chat, which children at this point were very used to. So Elmo's dad sets up this Zoom chat so that Elmo can connect with his friends on Sesame Street and also the other friends who have come to visit Sesame Street at, at, at one time or another. Um, but this was really about a feel good um, experience and, and the, the reach was tremendous. It was on HBO and, and other, net, uh, other networks within the Time Warner media world and also um, on PBS um, and on a host of other international networks. And so it was a very, was very well received. Uh, as you can see, 93% of the children um, liked it. And it, it was just a very playful, joyful uh, moment that uh, I thought at the time, uh, because it was at the fairly beginning uh, of, of quarantine, that uh, it, was, it was very much appreciated. Next slide, please. And we also had an opportunity to do this internationally. So Alam Simpson, is our co-production that we created in response to the Syrian humanitarian uh, crisis. And so um, this cr uh, wonderful production team uh, took inspiration from our play date. Oh, and I should talk about, you know, that play date special, we were all doing this remotely. I mean, everyone was in their home and it was a, 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 an editing through edit just was so seamless. Uh, so when you watch the special, Elmo and his dad were not even in the same physical space, uh, but we made it look as though they were sharing the same space. So um, once again, in, in this particular case with Alam Simpson, um, the key message is creating playful learning opportunities. You know, kids learn best through play and, and how to support and to show what that looks like, supporting the social emotional uh, development um, messages, uh, and of course, getting the important health messages out there to prevent um, getting sick. Next slide, please. And then I had the great pleasure to participate in uh, two CNN town hall specials, uh, the ABCs of COVID-19. And this was an opportunity for us, once again, to reach a larger audience with these very important messages about how to talk about this virus uh, with young children. And um, it was a lot of the, well, the show was really structured around the types of questions that children and families were, were grappling with and really turning to us to, to provide the answers. And so uh, we had an opportunity to convey this content through our Muppet characters as they interacted with the hosts, Sanjay Gupta and um, Erica Hill, uh, as well as bringing in um, the questions from, from family. So the first one dealt a lot from a health perspective and talking about what this virus is, how do you protect yourself, how do you make a mask, why are we wearing a mask, uh, what does six feet apart look like, the second one, um, because it came much later, it was uh, in June, it just aired a couple of weeks ago, uh, focused more on resiliency and, and, and how to cope with the social, emotional, big feelings that we're all dealing with as, um, I, don't, I don't even know what week we're in or what month we're in. Um, so, um, uh, so it took a different, different um, uh, point of view. 
Next slide, please. So we are now starting to produce content for season 52. So at the time of our stay at home orders, we were just finishing up season 51, which will air this fall. We had one week left of production. Um, and so we're thinking about what are, what's the show gonna look like in season 52. And we decided that we, we wanted to, and we don't even know when we're gonna be able to get into the studio to, pr to produce these scripts for season 52. So we, based on the success of the, the play date special and um, the, the scene in town halls, we're gonna create some stories via a Zoom platform. So where our characters are gonna be home and they're gonna engage in these video chats. And so one idea is they're gonna do an indoor carnival because they can't go to the carnival. So what kinds of carnival games can they do in each of their uh, homes? Um, another one is they're going to be playing a um, video game together and it'll be a problem solving game. The other category is how can we do some other stories, even if we're back in the studio, where the characters are at home and what do you do at home when you can't go outside based on a snowy day or a rainy day so you can have an indoor picnic or you could make uh, a pillow fort. Next slide, please. We also engaged with uh, advisors to talk about what are the themes that we should uh, move forward with, uh, because unfortunately we're learning that there's been one crisis after another. Um, and they really wanted us to emphasize, you don't need to be talking about COVID-19, but what you really need to do in your stories is to build these resiliency skills. Yes, it, you can apply it to COVID-19, but they're broader life skills. Uh, really emphasizing the importance for kids to have big feelings, not to shield them from these emotions. Um, routines, once we know, once again, we know that routines are really important for children to help them um, thrive. But we also know that children will negotiate these routines, especially in these stressful times, and how to help parents with these negotiations, because when children are negotiating, um, they are learning, you know, what they, what can happen and what, what can happen. Uh, because as it brings the next bullet, life is all about what ifs, <laughs> right? And you may not always have the answers. Um, and that's okay. And that's a really important for, for parents to know that you don't have to have all the answers. What's more important is to tell your, your child or your children, I don't know, let's go find out together. And that is that co-engagement and that spark of curiosity, I don't know the answer, but let's find out, is really about d developing lifelong learners. Next slide, please. Flexibility is key, empowering them. Children need choices, right? So unfortunately, parents are over-structuring kids and say, we're gonna do it this way. No, give them some choices so they have an understanding of, of, of what is in their control. We need to start empowering children so that they're not so reliant on us and then therefore they can't even solve their own, own problems. And this whole idea of needs versus wants, that comes up a lot, especially during the financial crisis that families are dealing with with COVID-19. They may not be able to get everything that their, their children wants, but they need to make sure that children are loved that they're protected, that they're safe, and their basic needs are being met. Staying healthy and teaching how the body works. What's happening now is that uh, families are telling us that children are worried that they're going to get sick and to explain to them that your body is built to survive. And, and if you do get this uh, virus, um, we're gonna be here to help you and we're gonna give you the care and you're, you're gonna get better. And of course, separation anxiety. Parents will eventually go back to work and the home environment is gonna look very different. And how do you help your child understand that even if you are going back, you're gonna be, you're gonna take care of yourself, you're gonna stay protected uh, and that you will return. And most importantly, I think for all of us listening uh, to, to, to this is we're all overwhelmed. And don't be ashamed to reach out and ask for help. And, and it's so important to teach these self-advocacy skills. So next slide. Um, 
that just gives you a glimpse into our world of content creation, how we pivoted to address um, these critical needs that kids and families are having um, during this, this monumental crisis, um, such as this pandemic. So I'll pass it over to Jeff. Great. I just want to say thank you, Rosemary, for that. Before we go to Jeff and say, you know, it's so amazing to me how I'm sure now 51 and a half years into Sesame Street, these themes of, you know, that we know are so central to child development around resiliency and dealing with big feelings. Um, you know, they, they always seem to be important now more than ever. And it's really great. Uh, I think the story themes that you've concluded with as well are really great lessons for entrepreneurs to take away right now on, on ways that they can best support children and families with the content that they're coming up with. So thank you so much. Um, and now we'll, we'll transition to uh, Sesame Workshops President and CEO, Jeff Dunn. Um, Jeff, it's a delight to have you with us today. And I know that um, it's one thing to uh, create content to help families and children navigate a crisis. You simultaneously uh, are helping an organization navigate through unprecedented times. And our entrepreneurs who are on the phone today are doing the same, um, some with big organizations, some with new organizations. Uh, but we're really excited to hear some of your thinking about how you've helped Sesame Workshop work through this uh, this challenging time. So Jeff, we'll let you take it away. All right. So um, thanks, thanks very much, and uh, just go right into it because I'm gonna leave some time for questions if we can. Um, so you know, as as was mentioned, I thought I would I would spend uh, just a a few minutes today trying to give you some insights to what we have done. This is my third. Um, you know, sort of recessionary crisis. Um, and uh, so, you know, I lived through 1987. I lived through 2008. Um, this is by far the, the hardest in a way. I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, but I, I thought I would share with you sort of the learnings fr from all of those. Um, I would acknowledge at the beginning, you know, some points here that say we are perhaps similar and also different from you. We're a nonprofit. I understand some of you are nonprofits, some of you for for profits. We are a nonprofit. Um, one of the interesting things about this is because of the situation, this pandemic, our resources have never been needed more, as Rosemary was just talking about. However, this is an economically difficult time for everybody. So you've got that weird balance of demand but also constrained resources, and that's, uh, that's got its challenges. Um, we are obviously not a startup, has been mentioned. We're 50 years into us, so we're not in the, in the same position, and we have you know, almost 500 full-time and part-time employees, so we're, we're bigger than um, you know, probably all of you are at, at this point. Um, we also have, a, we have earned revenue streams um, that I'll talk a little bit more about, but those have been really important to us. We don't just rely on donations. We have actually earned income and that, and that matters. Uh, and we've been adding through that to our rainy day fund. And I'll talk more about that in, the, in a second as well, because you know, planning for the rainy day is um, really important throughout your management of an organization. Next, please. So I, I mentioned that this is, of the three that I've lived through, this is the most uh, challenging. It is for two big reasons. The first is we know from over a lifetime that uh, a person's health is directly related to your mental health, your physical health, and your financial health. And all of those have to be you know, working together for you to have a healthy life. And this situation is going after all of them. You know, you've got the You've got the highly contagious and you know and deadly virus. You've got massive unemployment, which is impacting so many people. We now have added on to that social unrest from racism and racial injustice, and it is assaulting really all three of those: mental health, physical health, and financial health, for so many people all across the country, which makes it such a challenge. And then further, as you're leading an organization, you know when you're doing risk management, which all of us have to do you have the sort of the two axes, right? You've got what's the likelihood of this event happening and then what's the consequences of it happening? And you wanna you know, think about those boxes where you have a high likelihood and you know, deep uh, consequences are the ones you really need to think about and manage. But in this situation, both the likelihood and understanding that likelihood and the consequences of it are very uncertain. Um, and so it is, has become a real challenge for a lot of people to manage the organizations. It's become a challenge for governors to manage. Um, because of that. Next slide, please. 
So we're dealing with a lot of unknowns here. This is uh, the famous quote from Donald Rumsfeld. There are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say some things that um, we do not know, but there are also unknown unknowns, the ones we don't know we don't know. And, um, and, and Stephen Colbert you know, came back and said, aren't there things you think you know when you actually don't? Which is true too. And so keep, keep going. Next slide. Um, so, so you have to deal with that. And our approach to this has really been built uh, around eight things that we've, we've tried to lean into that I would sort of tell you are good things to do in any crisis. And I'm gonna talk more about these uh, in the rest of the presentation. But he, here's the list of eight that we're trying to follow. The first is we made the physical, emotional, financial health, those three things you know, that have to be in line, um, our priority of our staff. We said, you know, this is the group of people that is gonna do it for us and we've got to deal with their physical, emotional and financial health. Um, and so we've leaned into that first and foremost. The next is being flexible um, because this highly unusual situation where we have people at home and remote learning and, and people just have all kinds of different needs now. So we've had to be much more flexible than we were in the past. We've tried to seek input from the staff. We'll talk more about that. We've had to expand the ways we get input from the staff so that we are making sure we understand what's going on in their lives. We try to keep everybody in the loop. Uh, communication in crises is like it's communication, 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 uh, because people need to know what's going on. And, and that becomes ever, ever more important. Tr speaking with transparency and candor, um, you know, people will, will deal with hard news. They just want to know the truth. And so you can deliver hard news um, to people. And actually, if you look at what's going on nationwide, the failure to actually deliver hard news and to shy away from delivering you know, news and candor with transparency uh, has been a real problem. So lean into, um, lean into transparency and candor. We had to prioritize our work. We had to accept the fact that people were not gonna be able to do everything they could before because of these you know, situations at home. Half our, half our staff have kids. So we had to acknowledge we were gonna to have to set new priorities, more priorities than we did, and, and we leaned into that. Um, and then uh, it was about all the mission, you know, making sure that all that work that we could do during this time and that Rosemary talked about, we actually tried to lean into and get done. And then celebrating the successes. The successes become even more important and, and trying to say to people, um, you know, sort of well done becomes important during this time too. So for me, this got summed up as mission and staff, staff is mission. Now let me keep going and, and uh, move into it. Um, uh, so when, we, when this crisis began, one of the things that we did very quickly was set up an emergency task force. And that emergency task force had on it um, our, our general counsel, it had legal, it had of HR, it had IT, you know, finance and facilities, all the things that were you know, geared around whether we could work and, and helping us work remotely and what the issues around that were. And they tackled that right from day one. Um, and that task force has continued to meet. And the issues have gotten different uh, in some ways and remain the same in some ways. But having a group of people that is dedicated to meeting on a regular basis, absorbing the issues, you know, looking outwardly in terms of what's going on uh, in, the, in, the, in our case in New York and in the world, and then applying that to, our, to ourselves and our own situation um, became incredibly important to us and it's done a, it's done a great job. Um, the second thing we did, uh, my senior team, which is called the operations team, it's my direct reports, that used to meet weekly uh, for a couple hours every week. And right after this crisis began and people were pushed out work, working remotely, there were all kinds of issues developing. So we, we felt the need to like answer these questions quickly. And so we began to meet every day first thing in the morning. And that has actually continued that the amount of stuff that we have to deal with um, has, has actually sort of grown. And, uh, and so we have gone to actually daily um, senior team meetings to try and clear the decks and, and move stuff out in a, in a way that um, you know, acknowledges the urgency of the situation. Next, please, thank you. Um, so I mentioned this before, throughout the, throughout the crisis, the well-being of our staff has been our, our first priority. And we've had to really acknowledge that everybody has their own story. We have family members who are serving as emergency responders, and that adds another whole level. So perhaps not surprisingly, you know, we're a nonprofit and we have uh, people who have family members that are working in, on the front lines of this, of this crisis. And that 
adds another health risk and a very um, huge amount of uncertainty. So we have to acknowledge that. We have dependent care responsibilities among at least half the staff and, and that gives them less time to, to work and it's odd hours and everything. So we've had to acknowledge that. And even, the, even some of the people that don't have dependent care responsibilities found that this isolation, this period of isolation has been really hard and, uh, and they have an incremental sort of emotional needs. So we had to acknowledge that and lean into that. Um, so um, I would, when I, what I said to staff was, if you have to choose between you know, getting your work done and prioritizing your work and prioritizing your family, start with your family. None of this will work if you're not, you know, if your family doesn't work, your family is the most important thing. We all got to get through this together. We will recognize that. We will deal with that. Don't worry about your job security. Your job will be secure um, over that issue. And so as a result of that, we've seen all these teams come together in, in really great ways and people that didn't have dependent care stepping up and helping those who did. And it's been a really sort of great and, and team building experience. But it started with acknowledging that people's family needs were important and we could help each other out. Next. Okay, so um, flexibility isn't enough. We had to uh, have some must-haves here and prioritization. So what we did was we, we developed what's the list of things that must happen then to keep the lights on, what are the high priority deliverables that come next, and finally, what are the flexible deliverables? And we had to rethink a lot of things here because we were used to getting a lot of things done. So actually prioritizing became much more of an issue for us um, you know, sort of during this pandemic. Next. Um, okay, I mentioned this before about regular communication. So, you know, for the first 14 weeks of this, I sent out a regular email every night to the staff. It just started with, here's what you need to know. But then it became um, sort of, you know, almost a, a rallying point for, here's what's going on in the company, all different areas. Here's what I'm thinking about. Here's what I'm worried about in terms of what you should know about how I'm thinking about uh, different aspects of this crisis. And, and that became a, a huge um, rallying point for a lot of the staff. And then um, we had people you know, on our operations team start you know, breakfast with people virtually. It all just began to move out in ways that we were in regular contact uh, with. And we went to increase staff meetings. All staff meetings we used to do quarterly began to happen monthly. Next. Um, so it was critical for us to receive staff input. I mean, now instead of being in the office, we had, everything was happening remotely. We got all these people remotely, none of us are together, and we had to figure out ways to really absorb input of how people were doing. So we've done surveys of our employees. We've done three waves of them. You can see, um, you can see them there. We also do something called Ask Jeff Anything, which is the ability to uh, ask me questions and write in, and we began to do that on a daily basis too. Um, recently, we, we, we sort of curtailed that. It's going back to quarterly uh, because of the volume of them. But um, we, we did that to lean in to answer urgent questions that people had as well. Next. Okay, so how's this worked out? You can see some numbers here. This just says that um, when asked, you know, how Sesame Workshop was doing it, understanding and accommodating, you know, parents, um, you can see the ratings there. Uh, from we did this in our, our second and third wave, 87, 89%, and then how satisfied they were overall with how they were being treated, and that was you know 94%. So, so we've done pretty well with this. And if you, next slide, if you look at the contrast with um, some other people, we also asked people who had spouses, how understanding how you know good has your has your spouse's uh, organization been in that? That's on the left, and um, that top box is 37% compared to our 89%. And we do a nationwide survey as well to find out about family needs, and that was 71%. So we're, we're actually, all of those eight points are working really well to, to deliver up to our employees. Next. Um, okay, so there were still a great many unknowns to our future. I mean, this is, is what it's about, managing through unknowns. It's not clear when the office will reopen. It's not clear about our revenue streams going forward. It's not clear about when we're gonna be able to get back into studios. You know, it's, it's both from a revenue stream point of view, we have issues about not knowing just how consumers are going to purchase in the future, and we have issues about knowing how donors are going are to react. So um, that's, that's the real unknown we're having to deal with going forward. So next. So let me sort of summarize all that with some final thoughts about this when you're dealing with sort of um, all these unknowns. 
and I, I, I just jotted some thoughts down here. Uh, the first is, you know, don't get out over your skis. Um, and, and, and I guess I should go back to the headline here. Crises often reveal the strength of what you've built. You know, they, they, they really, if you've built it right and you've built it strong, it's gonna sustain, sustain itself during this time. But if you haven't, it's gonna really suffer from a weak foundation. And so, you know, if you get out over your skis um, or bet the farm, you're gonna be in real trouble in a, when a crisis comes. Rainy days always come. We've said to our board so many times, you know, these are good times and rainy days will come. And so growth at all costs is really actually pretty risky. And I know a lot of you get pushed to grow incredibly quickly um, you know, by, by VCs and things, but growth at all costs is really, um, really hard and in terms of the risk when crises come. So try and build your house of bricks, um, you know, like the three little pigs. Um, in times of uncertainty, you're gonna need to plan for multiple different outcomes. So all those different uncertainties that we have, we are planning for different um, outcomes and different paths that we're gonna have to take during those different outcomes. And, um, and you have to be ready to pivot because none of us really know, you know what path we're gonna end up on here. Good boards matter is another one I would say to you. Um, you know, having independent and fresh eyes is enormously helpful. Our board has been enormously helpful to us in terms of, they were, they were the ones actually the, back in February who said when we were first, you know, leaning in and thinking about the pandemic, they were the ones who said to us, even more so you should treat this even more seriously than you're treating it. And, uh, and it was really the board meeting, that afternoon of the board meeting that we formed our emergency task force. So good boards matter. Look for the opportunities to leverage your organization in the ways that are unique to you. So what Rosemary talked about, you know, all that remote stuff. In the kids' business, a lot of show content is animated. Almost all of it is animated. Well, that's uh, cheaper to make and you make it overseas, and, but it takes a long period of time. We had, uh, we had live action humans that were doing, you know, puppeteering and they were at home and we could send the Muppets to them and they could be live that day in a way and, and much quicker even on the tape thing. So we were able to lean into something that was our differentiating point and really made a difference. Raising money is always hard in a recession. You know, you've got to remember cash is king. We worry about our cash. We think about it too. Um, and, and you've just got to, and, and I guess I would say that that's, you know, sort of ties to the, to the last point, which is, it has been my experience through you know, the other two of these recessions, they last longer than people think. Everybody thinks you're gonna come out of these more quickly than you do, and, um, and, the, and the drag uh, goes on for a while, and so you've gotta make the cash last, and, um, and so you've gotta act with urgency in terms of the way you manage uh, to do that. So those are uh, some of the thoughts that um, you know, we have and we've been experiencing. Uh, we, we've come through it, pretty well. Um, I, I think our board would say we've, we've come through it actually probably exceptionally well at this point in time. Over Back, back over to you guys at, at Early Promise. Great. Thanks so much, Jeff and Rosemary. I, I got to say, I think you the together have crammed a um, early childhood development and organizational studies degree into about 40 minutes for us. So I have to say thanks for doing that. Um, we're running a little bit short on time. We have a couple of questions that uh, maybe we'll ask and then um, we'll wrap things up. I think uh, the first one that I, I wanted to put forward from um, one of the questions we got in advance is, you know, your organization as a nonprofit, as a mission, mission driven organization is incredibly intentional about how you create social impact in the world. And we are wondering in the face of COVID-19, um, how did you, how did you think about uh, your, I know Rosemary, you talked a little bit about the like summative evaluations that you do afterward, but did your mindset have to shift at all about how to, the kind of impact that you want to have and how you think about capturing and learning from evaluation as you go in, in such a, you know, rapidly changing environment? Yeah, so we, we had to move out rather quickly, so we couldn't do that formative, we couldn't uh, adhere to our research model doing formative uh, research, but that's where we relied a lot on our advisors. So um, we, we, we went with the best practices, and we knew that we needed to focus both on these health messages, but most importantly, these resiliency messages. And so, and we've, we've built a lot of knowledge over the years, because we've been focused on these uh, self-regulation executive function strategies for a while now. 
That's great. Um, and then, you know, we have one in the chat here from uh, Delon Crosby who asks, um, I appreciate Sesame's dynamic research oriented approach um, and, and focus on executive function. Uh, and then his question follows, and I'll add some additional context, which is, as you noted, Jeff, a lot of the 200 ventures that are in the Promise Network are um, some version of a for-profit or a non-profit or a hybrid, and, and often they are juggling this question. Um, and so Delon asks, is Sef, is, if Sesame were a for-profit organization, do you think you would have had the level of so, social impact that you've had to date? Um, any reflections on that? Uh, I think not, actually. Um, you know, if you're a for-profit organization, you are trying to maximize your bottom line. We're not trying to maximize our bottom line. We're trying to uh, maximize our mission. And I say it's all the mission money can buy. So uh, we try and set for ourselves a target to make some money. So we have a rainy day fund, and we've been very successful doing that. We built up a good rainy day fund that's you know, a great cushion during times like this. Uh, but we've been able to expand our mission and reinvest consistently over the last five years. Every year we've invested more uh, because we don't have to maximize our, our bottom line profit for shareholders. We, um, we just set a, a threshold target of profitability and then we look above that to see if we can't reinvest in more mission. Thanks, that's great. Um, so we're gonna move to closing. This has been an action-packed uh, 55 minutes so far, and I wanna just leave a little bit of time to let the folks on the line know how they can, um, how they can apply and stay engaged with uh, Promise Venture Studio through the fellowship and our partners at Sesame and the Harvard Center on the Developing Child. But before we shift to that, I do just wanna say one more giant thanks to Rosemary and Jeff for sharing uh, your insights with us today. It is really a treat to have um, such an uh, impactful organization and such a mission-minded organization who um, I think we've all turned to. I know with my own almost two-year-old daughter, we watched your most recent town hall on, um, on questions about race and systemic racism, and uh, you continue to lead the way. So it's a real pleasure to have you, and I just want to say thanks on behalf of all of us. Thank you. Thanks. Great. All right. Um, so. With a, a couple minutes left, I just want to turn to remind folks that we are getting uh, toward the um, launch of the fellowship application for the Promising Ventures Fellowship uh, next Monday, the 29th. Uh, the application will be available on our website, promiseventurestudio.org. Um, and if you haven't already been on that website, there are numerous uh, question and answer FAQ documents available. We will be hosting another one of these sessions coming soon with um, fellows from last year's inaugural cohort who will be sharing some of their stories of how they grew their social impact and um, grew their, the sustainability of their organization. So um, we invite you to join us for those. And of course, if you ever have any questions uh, that just need to be answered immediately, if you're a part of the Promise Venture Network, you can ask us through the Slack channel of 350 innovators on there. Um, or email us at team at promisestudio.org. Um, but we're really excited. We're hoping that you'll consider applying for the fellowship and uh, being a part of the Promise Venture Network. We realize that to de deliver outcomes for children and families, especially those facing the greatest adversity, that uh, we have to do that across a wide variety and diversity of organizations, social entrepreneurs, and other partners. And we're excited to have you as a part of that community. So you can check out the chat box now. My teammate Awara has posted some of those links that I referenced. And like I said, we look forward to hearing back uh, from you and thank you so much for your time today. We know an entrepreneur's most valuable asset is their time and giving it to us and sharing it with us today in the spirit of driving social impact for children and families is something that um, we deeply appreciate. So on behalf of the Promise team, the Sesame team and the Harvard Center team, Thank you for joining us and we look forward to being in touch with you again soon.